hey, check it out. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Witness me in all my disheveled glory because I went to the gym earlier and I didn't get a chance to shower before the heavens parted and Noah came by and said he was my Uber driver. So, eh, I'm just going to read Fall of the House of Usher, and I'm not going to do my Shakira until someone's around to watch, because, I mean, <laughs> I think I'm only going to be able to do that once. Sorry about that. Kristen texted me. I haven't heard from her in months. So I had to answer back. <clears throat> so as we left off yes yesterday, Roderick Usher is dealing with fear. And back to it. I learned, moreover, at intervals and through broken and equivocal hints, another singular feature of his mental condition. He was enchained by certain superstitious impressions in regard to the dwelling which he tenanted. And whence, for many years, he had never ventured forth. In regard to an influence whose superstitious force was conveyed in terms too shadowy here to be restated an influence which some peculiarities in the mere form and substance of his family mansion had by dent of long sufferance he said obtained over his spirit an effect which the physique of the gray walls and turrets the dim tarn into which they all looked down had at length brought about upon the morale of his existence He admitted, however, although with hesitation, that much of the peculiar gloom which thus afflicted him could be traced to a more natural and far more palpable origin, to the severe and long-continued illness, indeed to the evidently approaching dissolution of a tenderly beloved sister, his sole companion for long years, his last and only relative on earth. Her decease, he said with a bitterness which I can never forget, will leave him, him, the hopeless and the frail, the last of the ancient race of the ushers. While he spoke, the Lady Madeline, or so she, was she called, passed slowly through a remote, a remote portion of the apartment, and without having noticed my presence, disappeared. I regarded her with an utter astonishment, not unmingled with dread, and yet I found it impossible to account for such feelings. A sensation of stupor oppressed me as my eyes followed her retreating steps. 
When a door at length closed upon her, my glance sought instinctively and eagerly the countenance of the brother, but he had buried his face in his hands, and I could only perceive that at a far more than ordinary wanness had overspread the emaciated fingers through which trickled many passionate tears. Two likes so far. Hooray! Where was I? <clears throat> the disease of the Lady Madeline had long baffled the skill of her physicians. A settled apathy, a gradual wasting away of the person, and frequent, although transient, affections of a partially cataleptical character were the unusual diagnosis. Hitherto, she had, been, she had steadily borne up against the pressure of her malady, and had not betaken herself finally to bed, but on the closing in of the evening of my arrival at the house, she succumbed, as her brother told me at night, with inexpressible agitation the prostrating power of the destroyer, and I learned that the glimpse I had, I had obtained of her person would thus probably be the last I should obtain, that the lady, at least while living, would be seen by me no more. Can everybody hear me, or can anybody hear me, rather? Who all is here? <laughs> For several days ensuing, her name was unmentioned by either Usher or myself, and during this period I was busied in earnest endeavors to alleviate the melancholy of my friend. We painted and read together, or I listened as if in a dream, to the wild improvisations of his speaking guitar, and thus at a closer and still intimacy, and thus as a closer and still intimacy admitted me more unreservedly into the recesses of his spirit, the more bitterly did I perceive the futility of all attempt at cheering a mind from which darkness, as if an inherent positive quality, poured forth upon all objects of the moral and physical universe in one unceasing radiation of gloom. I shall ever bear about me a memory of the many solemn hours I thus spent alone with the master of the house of Usher, yet I should fail in any attempt to convey an idea of the exact character of the studies, or of the occupations in which he involved me, or led me the way. An excited and highly distempered ideality, there is so Sulfurous luster overall. His long improvised dirges will ring forever in my ears. Among other things, I hold painfully in mind a certain singular perversion and amplification of the wild air of the last waltz of von Weber. From the paintings over from the paintings over which his elaborate fancy brooded, and which grew touch by touch into vaguenesses at which I shuddered. The more thrillingly, because I shuddered knowing that why, from these paintings, vivid as their images now are before me, I would in vain endeavor to educe more than a small portion, which should lie within the compass of merely written words. By the utter simplicity, by the nakedness of his designs, he arrested an overall attention. If ever mortal painted an idea, that mortal was Roderick Usher. For me, at least, in the circumstances then surrounding me, there arose out of the pure abstractions was the hypochondriac contrived to throw upon his canvas, an intensity of intolerable awe, no shadow of which I felt, 
no shadow of which felt I ever yet, and the contemplation of the certainly glowing yet too concrete reveries of Fusilli. Who's that? One of the phantasmagoric conceptions of my friend, partaking not so rigidly of the spirit of abstraction, may be shadowed forth, although feebly, in words. A small picture presented the interior of an immensely long and rectangular vault or tunnel, with low walls, smooth, white, and without interruption or device. Certain accessory points of the design served well to convey the idea that this excavation lay at an exceeding depth below the surface of the earth. No outlet was observed in any portion of its vast extent, and no torch or other artificial source of light was discernible. Yet a flood of intense rays rolled throughout and bathed the whole in a ghastly and inappropriate splendor. <clears throat> I have just spoken of that morbid condition of the auditory nerve which rendered all music intolerable to the sufferer, with the exception of certain effects of stringed instruments. It was perhaps the narrow limits to which he thus confined himself upon, upon the guitar, which gave birth in great measure to the fantastic character of his performances. But the fervid facility of his impromptus could not be so accounted for. They must have been and were in the notes, as well as in the words of his wild fantasias, for he not unfrequently accompanied himself with rhymed verbal improvisations. The result of that intense mental collectedness and concentration to which I have previously alluded as observable only in particular moments, the highest artificial excitement. The words of one of these rhapsodies I have easily remembered. I was perhaps the more forcibly impressed with it as he gave it because in the under or mystic current of its meaning, I fancied that I perceived and for the first time a full consciousness on the part of Usher, of the tottering of his lofty reason upon her throne. The verses, which were entitled The Haunted Palace, ran very nearly, if accurate, if not accurately, thus. Oh, hi, Wicket. Are you bored? Are you bored? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to sing this. Verse 1. In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch thought's dominion, it stood there. Never a seraph spread opinion over fabric half so fair. Verse 2. Banners yellow, glorious golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time, long ago. Every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts bloomed and pallid a winged odor to weigh. Verse 3. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous, luminous windows saw, spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law. Round about a throne were sitting, poor Fergine, in state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen.
and all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door through which came flowing 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 and sparkling evermore a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing and voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king but evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate Ah, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim-remembered story of the old time entombed. And travellers now within that valley, through the red lit windows, see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while, like a rapid ghastly river through the pale door, the hideous throng rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more. I well remember that suggestions arising from this ballad led us into a train of thought wherein there became manifest an opinion of Usher's which I mention not so much on account of its novelty, for other men have thought thus, as on account of the pertinacity which with he maintained it. This opinion, in its general form, was that of the sentience of all vegetable things, but in his disordered fancy, the idea had assumed a more daring character and trespassed upon certain conditions, or under certain conditions, upon the kingdom of inorganization. I lack words to express the full extent or the earnest abandon of his persuasion. The belief, however, was connected, as I have previously hinted, with the grey stones of the home of his forefathers. The conditions of the sentience had been here, he imagined, fulfilled in the method of collocation of these stones in the order of their arrangement, as well as in that of the many fungi which overspread them, and of the decayed trees which stood around, above all, in the long, undisturbed endurance of this arrangement reduplication in the still waters of the tarn. Oh, hello, cat. It's evidence, the evidence of the sentience was to be seen, he said, and I here started as he spoke in the gradual yet certain condensation of an atmosphere of their own about the waters and the walls. The result was discoverable, he added, and that silent yet importune and terrible influence which for centuries had molded the destinies of his family and which made him what I now saw him, what he was. Such opinions need no comment and I will make none. Yeah, okay, there's a lot more. So. This is probably going to take me several days to get through it. I honestly did not remember this being this long. So, yeah. And I'm going to stop reading Poe now and read something else because this story is really taxing. So it'll probably take multiple installments for me to actually finish the damn thing because evidently Poe has never heard of the run on sentence. Mm-hmm. 
Interesting stuff. <laughs> Live streaming on YT. Hmm. Let's open up my drive. I'm actually quite tired today because. Yeah, I went to the gym earlier. It wasn't for very long, but to be honest, I'm out of practice. Because the last time I went to the gym, it was at Towson, and that was five or six years ago. All right. So now I'm going to pull up some of my own poetry. Because I'm tired of reading Poe for right now. Here's one of mine. Three yellow balloons. Last night they came to me in a dream, or so it seems. Three yellow balloons. Hey, they said to me, why don't you pop us and see what's inside? So I took them at their words. What an odd duck request. I popped the first one. Inside was a mango. I popped the second one. Inside was a lemon. And then I popped the third one. Inside was a banana. Nana, they crowed. Want a banana? Oh, so ripe. I tried to run away, and that was that. I guess at bedtime, no more pie. Let's pull ice cubes and bubbles. Ah, oh, damn, don't tell me. Well, damn. I guess I haven't added that one yet. Into my back into my Google Drive. Okay. So here's one called My Canvas. If I had a silver-backed canvas, I'd paint you a thousand words of cats, meows, and dog hairs, and warm-bellied cuddles. Like splashes of watercolor puddles, paint drips and drops on my canvas. My canvas is a page, only a poor substitute like a shadow on the wall, dancing in some dimly lit cave. Walking along streets they never pave, I'm making it all up as I go along. Like a rain cloud in the night, don't forget your coat, umbrella, and boots. My canvas is a heart, on which I hope these words engrave. Let's sleep on it for now, and at the end find the next start. I don't remember writing that. Maybe my wife did, or maybe I wrote it for her. So there's some references in there, like Plato's cave that only I would make. So you beware the broken barrier. Did this one already, I believe.
Oh, yes. Out past the asteroid belt. We say I love you to the moon and back. Well, I love you more out past the asteroid belt and down to the Earth's core. Why can't our pinky promises be more than those, perhaps our vows? Alas, no well. We might, re we might not remember those, but we'll remember these. I vow to keep you safe, happy, and warm. Even if you insist I'm not responsible for everyone, I can't help it. It's in my nature. You make me better, even when I want to shut down or shrink away. You know how I am. So I vow to work on that. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know how this works. I'm a work in progress. But I vow to make that progress with you to the moon and back. Okay, yeah, I definitely wrote that for my wife. Oh, well, I wouldn't feel right reading to the moon and back because that's one my wife wrote for me. And I don't know if I wrote the known universe for her or not. This is my first live stream. I don't think I've done one before. <laughs> Taking a break to rest my voice. Sorry, everyone. read the miles to go before I sleep home if that's okay.
Oh, here it is. Stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He would not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there's some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. Hmm. Don't want to read. Okay, everyone. Vote real quick. Do you want me to read a story called Angel Small Death? Or one called Rogue Elements. So I'll save Angel a small death for another day. And yes, I named it after the Hosier song. Okay. Well, here's Rogue Elements. It was... It's extremely unfinished. Hand-rolled clove and cinnamon cigarettes couldn't block out that smell. A persistent fit, fetid stink that clung to every last particle. Decay was a difficult scent to mask, and sad to say, decay was in overabundance. It wasn't often a corpse was the centerpiece of a room. Dead bodies aren't excellent additions to the decor. Giving up the smoke is a bad job, Darius adjusted his cracked leather gloves. He brushed the ashes away with an impatient twitch of his hand, which gave a phantom tremble as though reaching for another one. This wasn't the time. Poor bastard. A lazy drawl sounded from the doorway. Darius looked up to see his partner, Ramirez, swaggering into the room. For a moment, Darius didn't speak. He had found a hyacinth petal clenched in the cadaver's hand. What could the flower symbolize? Any clues yet, Ramirez said, almost disinterestedly staring down at the body. Sulfur's fumes began to walk from the body. Sulfur. It was one of us, Darius said, but this flower, I have no idea what the flower could mean. What? Hyacinth? Maybe he just wanted to smell pretty. 
Ramirez replied with a careless shrug. Come on, Dar. Let's get to the pub already. I'm fair parched. Like I said, that's all there was. Very, very short and very, very unfinished. In fact, next to the title, I said 4, 12, 16, 2, eh? Three question marks. Okay, well, let's do Angel's small death, but, uh, and attaching a trigger warning here, the viewpoint character is very, very stalkerish. Is that okay? This has been almost 40 minutes, so I'll do Angel Small. Yeah, and then sign. Okay, well, let's go. There goes the last of my Gatorade. Okay. Angel, small death. And she was all mine. The way she moved was like magic. She was so close, only feet from me. So close, I could almost taste her. Even with the sweat dripping off of her from the heat of the stage lights, she would still be sweet, like candy, like an angel, my angel. But then she started gyrating on the guitars from her band. She must be playing hard to get or putting on a little show for me. Either way, it just made me more mad. Why should that little bitch get to touch my angel like that? I'll have to deal with her later. Right now, there's a concert, and I must be in attendance. What, my, what, what will my love think if I miss a show? Sure, she doesn't exactly know me from any of the other screaming fans. She, uh, she, she was a whirlwind on stage, bouncing around in the lights, blinking red, blue, purple. She sang like her throat was about to catch fire. As she belted out the words to Cherry Bomb, by the runaways, she cleaved through the dry ice smoke with a disco ball swinging from a long silver cord. Her hair glistened with sweat, turning in strawberry blonde to a playful shade of grapefruit instead. Her lacy black long sleeve top curved around her shoulders in a deliberately uneven cut, and she was all mine. Angelica. A tiny golden nipple ring glittered through the sheer fabric of her shirt, one layer away from total exposure. At this rate, she might as well not have worn it at all. The song ended. She stopped to breathe, and the entire mosh pit pulsated with lust. A carnal adrenaline had only surged when the next number started. Tonight was a night of covers, packed with tributes to her influences instead of her own original material. She cupped her fingers around the guitar's chin. I felt the rage swelling ever larger inside me, but I did nothing. This can wait. 
I lost myself in her movement instead. How could anyone move with such grace to music that basically demands the opposite? Last edit was nine days ago. I don't remember doing that. Oh well, not surprised. My memory is shit. Her skull, if her, wow, if her skirt was a black hole, she was the event horizon. Her thighs could squeeze me down the jellied spaghetti, falling infinitely through time into the uncharted wilds of another dimension. Worth it, I deem, if that other dimension was her. I would like get, are you bored again? You probably are. She finished the song. After running through Hailstorm and the Pretty Reckless earlier in the night, she was digging deep. Ugh. Sorry. Ugh, reflux. Torn by Natalie and Bruglia. Kiss Me by Sixpence None the Richer. Complicated by Avril Lavigne. I'm surprised she didn't hit any of an essence. For her encore, she chose Misery Business by Paramore. As the encore ended, a fan, a fan squirmed her way onto the stage. The security guards let her through. Was this a part of the show? The fan couldn't have been older than 17 or 18, early college age at the oldest. The fan threw her arms around Angelica like a child hugging a giant teddy bear on Christmas morning. Angelica twisted her around in a classic ballroom dip before licking up the hollow of her throat and finishing off with a wet, sloppy kiss. The mic and disco ball, abandoned and forgotten, thumped to the floor and the guards came to collect the wayward starstruck fan. I love you! I love you! The fan was still shrieking as security hauled her away. Angelica blew her a kiss as a parting gift. Thank you! Where are the Cody and scene? Good night! I felt a thrill of gratitude towards event security for dragging the interloper away. Angelica was all mine. I caught up with her in the dressing room backstage, using my press pass to walk right by skeptical stagehands and burly guards. Hello, Angelica. I'm Damon. I write for Wave magazine. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? She had one of those electronic cigarette things in one hand and was chugging a mana potion energy drink from the other. Sure thing, hotshot. What's on your mind? First things first, what's the deal with the post-encore extracurriculars? I, would get, I like kissing girls at my gig, at all my gigs. Guys are lame kissers. If I wanted something slobber, if I wanted something to slobber all over my face, I'd get a dog. She smirked in a contemplative way. Have I got some stories for you? Off the record, of course. She was all mine for an interview. Get the Pulitzer are ready. And the next bit was supposed to switch to Angelica's perspective, but it never got farther than, you know, her transition paragraph. So, yeah. That'll do it for me. This has been today's video. At almost 45 minutes long. That went fast. Uh, Alright guys. I'm going to end the stream now.